Hello. If you want to skip ahead, I, I've put a time on screen, but if not, um, I'll clarify before we start if you haven't seen these videos before. I'm not a linguist, I'm just uh, an archaeology student with access to university library uh, who's very interested in these kinds of things. So because I've been unable to do the Anglo-Saxon short film I was planning to do in time for Christmas because of Covid, I, I thought I'd fill that gap with something else. So the premise of this is that there are 12 recordings, all of men with suspiciously similar voices, and each one is set 60 years after the last one, and each one is the grandson of the previous one. So there's that kind of familial connection thing, because I thought that would be cool. Um, and it, it shows the progression of southeastern English from about 1340 to 2006. So hopefully you enjoy, and there'll be annotations on the screen, things like that. I'm probably not going to be able to um, to subtitle it until tomorrow morning, so it'll be interesting to see if people are able to understand. I, I imagine people will be able to get the hang of the earlier recordings. Um, so yes, until until next time, Merry Christmas, and I hope you enjoy this little video. Thirteen forty-six. When he was younger. Uh, we tell you a tale from about spring tide of when he was full well young. My father was ever clad in old wool from a shape he had of when he was young. A full, ready, and never to fall apart, a dusky shape in mutton bane. And the wool was teeth about him. And we sighed on thy, Father, your wool hath moths. It hath moths in the, sh uh, in the arms, it hath moths in the shoulders, it hath moths in the elbows. And not the wool alone, your hair hath moths, your heat hath them. Uh, he was twenty, should say, and he was no chill then. Um, my father then sat up and said, If that he have moths, then to have moths is to bane myself. And he knew not what child to have me bane, if not myself. Did we told him anything more about the moths after that, had he no care. 1406. He had a ground seer when he was the age. He had a ground seer sat with me in our house. It was a few stones from here on the horseback going south. And I remember when it went over to this house. Uh, this house was the river's hair, not the river we have a new, but it was his ground seer's. He lived not in it, but he had, his, uh, he had it as his own for us to live in. And we were kind. Nobody had lived in it for years. Think of all the uh, cobwebs around. All the hawks had cobwebs around them. You could not hang your, your hat on the hawks or you'll find a spider made a home in your hat. And we had to rip out on while and the wattle was all uh, rotten. You know, the dog which will never be rotten. But it was all, uh, me thinking about it, it was woven and left out somewhere for five years and then they made the house out of it. But it was all shot with woodworm. Think of a woodworm graving through daub. It was shot with it. That must have been in it when it was a dauben. So it was never well mad, that house. And it learned on seed. We had to tear them down two of the walls and put them back up. And if you talk down that wall, that's a wall from before. If you talk that down, you'll find it was still shot. 1466. We still had a Christmas day long before thou were tear all the uh, a great deal of it was the same as it is now. So we had logs in the fair. The fair pit wasn't in the middle of the room when he was young. It was off the own seed, off over there. In the house I lived in as a boy, my grandsire one day. He put a pair of logs on and our neighbour knocked on the door. So my grandsire goes to the door and opens it up and it lets this ungodly draught in for it's snowing, ice cold out there and it's our neighbour called Thomas and he said, my dog had run off and they come past here and my grandsire then said, no, I've not seen him, not in the house. My neighbour side, my grandson side, 
er ran past there. So I went off into the night and came back and knocked again and my grand seer opened the door. So I'd look, John, I'm sorry, my horse had run away as I come past there. My grand seer said, no, no, not come past there. And the next time we saw our neighbour, we were doing the coast the next morning and they was far off and they came over. They said, I'm sorry about the confusion. I found the horse who was spooked and he hadn't been well tied up. So he ran off into the woods. And my grandsire said, Did you find your dog? And they said, That was my grandson. He thought he said the dog had run over there. But he meant to say the dog was run over there. So on the way past, when it was spoked, the horse had run over the dog and killed it. 1526 I lived further out when I was younger and over near the Thames and we lived in the middle of nowhere and we saw uh, all sorts there. I, I snared rabbits to sell down the market so I never put my uh, knife in anything bigger than a rabbit till I was twenty. Father insisted on doing all the slaughtering. But the owns came down to me snare. Uh, I know the spot they ran through. I put a snare in this hedge. The owns came down to it all morning and found there was a weasel in there still alive. And weasels are vicious things. <clears throat> so I got the biggest, greatest, longest stick I could find and knocked it over the head and untied it and threw it in some brambles. 1586 We cut a tray down and we dragged this log down from the forest. We did it ourselves on boards for our horses were both uh, not well good and we hadn't any oxen. So we dragged this log ourselves for we couldn't afford a horse to fall down. There's preventure twelve of us out there dragging this great big log down I don't know how far with ice and cold hands for it was winter and winters were colder then and this is a great big log we cut these great slats out of it and set fires in the slats and we had this great log slowly burning away for days and that was it every year we hardly went inside around Christmas we did our work and came back to the log and by the time January came around, we went back inside and it was musty and dreary and you couldn't move for the rats that had moved in. 1646 We didn't ever have geese as fat as this to eat. When I was little, we had little lank geese. We had a preventer eight that we kept around Christmas to sell everyone round there. Or not round there, because when I was little, we lived across the Thames. We sold... Uh, to five families but they were little ropey things and we had a few more decorations back then we had a little etching of Mother Mary that we put at the end of those and we had a crucifix Jesus on the cross and we put that on our big oak table leaning against the end ah, they're talking about no Christmas now altogether 1706 when I was younger, much younger before you were born, when your father was only just born, though I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't mind it, um, a baker in London, the handmaid, had left an old rag by the fire and a cloth catch fire and a floorboards catch it off the cloth and a flower bags catch it off the floorboards and if, if you have a fire on flour, it sets off burning and the baker was burned to the ground and the buttress was burned to the ground and the uh, green grocers was burned to the ground and this was in the middle of London and if you climbed up on the roof you could see it from here the flames would have been a hundred yards high and it was windy blowing winds and you could see the fire bright across the sky uh, and where we are here the wind was blowing the fire right towards us so you couldn't see the sun and uh, there was a shadow cast from all the smoke and if you went outside, it stunk horribly because everything in London was burning and our clothes went all the wrong colour from the smoke. 
and they had to knock down buildings just to stop the fire spreading and if you went outside you couldn't see a lot of the stars because the uh, because there's orange light all night <coughs> hmm. I said you knew how the three wise men must have felt and a hundred uh, churches came down and a houses between them and I should think on the first night it took people their maker so you must never leave a cloth by the fire especially not a butter cloth 1766 there was an old woman what lived in a hill and if she's not gone she's living there still she sold baked apples and blackberry pies and she's the old woman what never told lies Bar bar black sheep, have you any wool? Yes, my old mate, three bags full. Own for the master, uh, own for the dame, own for the little boy crying in the lane. My father knew a crooked man what went a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence up against a crooked stile. He had a crooked cat what catched a crooked mouse. And they both lived together in his crooked wooden house. 1826. I only knew my granddad from when I was very, very little. I don't remember him especially well because he died when I was seven. All I remember about him is he was very much like your father. He'd always to be working. He never had a pen in his foot or he never had no reason to be inside. He was always out making wheels because he was a wheelwright much like your father but not much like me because when I was younger I can say for myself that I always looked for a reason to stay in the house and do something easy but my granddad could never stay still all I knew of him is from my mother she says every Christmas when he got too old to work and my father took on most of it he would sit of a Christmas day in a corner and read and read everything he could get his hands on. So he read me pretty songs, but he also read uh, all manner about economics and the, the wider world, and he knew everything. But the problem with a man like that is that when it comes to the end, you simply can't tell all that to anyone else and expect them to remember it and short of being rich enough to travel around the world you are not best placed to do anything with it else I know everything what I need to know and I haven't read a word since I was in school I make a habit of it or to put it better I don't make a habit of it 1886 <clears throat> I'll tell you something. When I was younger, I used to go down to the public house every other day and drink with my friends. This was about when the Queen was first crowned, when I, when I was 30 or so. So all sorts was coming round here, coming into pubs, crowds all over. Um, I didn't want to know about it because there was all sorts of burks out in the street causing avoc because most of them never seen a proper street before. Most of them come from the middle of piss or nowhere, excuse my expression. Uh, so I made a custom of not talking to them. But one day, I seen walking past the public house with her friend, the most wonderful girl, what I'd ever seen. And she glanced in a public house, and I thought she caught my eye and turned and said something to her friend uh, in her friend's ear. And I don't tell my friends where I'm off to. I run after her and catched her. And she turns around. Most radiant girl I'd ever seen. I to perfection. Most beautiful dress to wear for coronation, I should think. And I put on my proud voice. And I said, I couldn't help but notice that you caught my high in a public house back there. And she chuckles and says, Mean as anything, 
I was only telling my sister what a shit house it looked like. 1946. When I was a lot younger, talk about before the war, this was before the war, before the Boer War, quite a long time actually. We had a nice lavish sort of living room, but we didn't have a dining room, so we used to drag the table in the living room to have our Christmas dinner. And it was me, mother, father, my brothers, and it was my granddad while he was still alive. And he used to tell the most blue jokes across the table. And an old, old, old man used to tell the most blue jokes, sparing no detail. And we'd be laughing, bashing on the table. And one night on New Year's Eve, I thought I'd tell my own joke. I can't have been more than about seven. And they all looked at me expectantly. And I said, Mother, I can't tell the joke. It's too blue. And she says, no, it's all right. It's New Year's Eve and we could do with a laugh. So I said, all right. I pulled the tablecloth up to my face, ready to hide if she decided she was going to hit me. And I said, what's blue? And she said, I don't know. What's blue? And I said, your face when Grandad says... And then I said a swear word. And he looked at me for a second, not amused, and he says, if you want to get a laugh out of the boys at school, you shall have to do better than that. 2006. We used to be a bit of a caroling family, so we used to go all round the houses on Christmas Eve singing carols, because all but one of us was lucky enough to have Christmas off work, Christmas Eve off work. So we went round singing... And when I was about 20, it snowed in some parts of London on Christmas Eve. This was back in the 60s. And it snowed properly too. It wasn't just a thin layer. It was proper snow that your foot crunched right into. And me and my sister never seen anything like it. That, that's your Aunt Beryl. We never, we'd never seen proper snow before apart from on the telly. And in pictures, you can sort of tell how hard and crunchy it is from looking at pictures or looking at the telly. But you can't imagine feeling how cold it is in the palm of your hand and how cold a snowflake is on your hand or your tongue. So we went back to chill. We were like children again. We were running around more energetic than I had been for five years or ten years or whatever in the snow. And you may know what it's like when it snows in the countryside, but you don't know what it's like when it snows in London till it does.